Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Hay here in Southern India. I wanted to um, let you know about a publication that will be released fairly soon within the next couple months, and that is Hermeneutical Death, the Technological Destruction of Subjectivity by Chad Haig. Now, this is a book which I had the idea to write um, literally the day after I released my last book um, and hadn't even really gone all the way through the um, Amazon processing, and I already had the idea for this book ready. And this book will differ from my previous publications in that it won't be a book so much about peak oil um, as it will be a book specifically about technology and specifically the question whether subjectivity is slowly being destroyed by technology. Now, obviously, that is an enormously controversial thing to say, and I can already hear people um, resisting that claim. And yet, I'm going to try to show in this um, in this book, and to the extent that I'm able within this video as well, that if you think about this problem philosophically, it's very difficult to argue otherwise. Now, of course, the question of whether there's an ongoing technological destruction of subjectivity, specifically a death at the hermeneutical level, is going to require um, a, a thorough critique of certain figures within the history of philosophy that you will see in this video that I haven't really treated so much in, in the other publications I've had. So I'm going to um, talk about Deleuze's theory of cinemas. Um, cinema for Deleuze is not merely an artificial reconstruction of time from these isolated fragments in which you just piece them together and generate this illusion of time. Rather for him, you get the movement image, and that's a very complicated argument, which you know, I'll do a whole video on very, very soon on, on, on cinema, but that's exactly what I'm not going to argue is going on with um, the kind of constant exposure to what I call these pixel screen illusions. Um, on smartphone screens, television screens, laptop screens, all of that. Um, so there'll be a, a big critique of, of Deleuze, but there'll also be a um, critique of Gadamer, in which Gadamer's theory of hermeneutics, in which he moves beyond the traditional hermeneutical problem of theological interpretation of the Bible or philological interpretation of classical texts, to instead think about uh, what does it mean for understanding and being in general to deal with this extended um, understanding of hermeneutics, that's certainly very important. Um, but I'm going to argue that the particular challenges to that hermeneutical horizon, which we get from modern technology, are things which Gadamer largely was not able to um, talk about in his much earlier work. And of course, uh, Kaczynski and Ilul focus on interpretation and technology specifically, in that for Ilul, it's actually technological deficiency which provides a condition for subjective development. If the tool is not self-sufficient, you have to grow as a human person. And of course, when technique gains the upper hand over humans, you're um, forced either into the position of the inspector or the technician. And even at that point, you lose the horizon of interpretation because as the system becomes ever more rationalized on a purely technical level, there um, becomes less and less need for any subjective interpretation because um, the result is itself so objectively superior to either past versions of it or simply um, an inevitable outcome of the processing of the machine itself, that there's no need for a subject at all in there. And of course, the kind of system that you get with greater levels of technical rationalization is when you actually kind of change the meaning of system. I'm arguing in this book that, you know, um, in the Middle Ages, for example, system was largely a metaphysical concept. In Thomas Aquinas, for example, you have these metaphysical systems that manifest the order of the universe to you through essences and substances, which are not subjective illusions. They are manifestations of the universe's order in itself. Okay. And whereas with Kant, you get more like transcendental systems. These are systems still, but they're largely fixed um, to the to the subject's mind rather than directly manifesting the order of the universe itself. And you kind of have this postmodernist um, you know, uh, destruction of that in favor of something more like void systems, as I call it, with Derrida and um, 
other postmodernists, the emphasis instead becomes on how well there are no systems except for this, um, uh, the, the emphasis on a systematic um, refutation of, of systems. But of course, these days, even that is not an adequate explanation for what we have. These days, what we, we really have are executable systems. The systems that are really important today exist neither metaphysically in the the universe, nor even transcendentally in the mind. They rather exist only to the extent that they're executed. So the Google algorithm, for example, is in a certain sense a system. It's just a system whose very being is nothing more than execution. If you literally didn't have um, machines burning electrical energy to execute it, it wouldn't exist. Okay. If you tried to artificially reconstruct it with pen and paper, that would only be something of an imitation. The real system would have to be only in execution. Okay. And this has posed a different kind of role for the subject. The subject had a specific role in metaphysical, transcendental, etc. systems. Um, even in the void system, you could play these games with endless deconstructing, which is actually a subjective acti activity. But with executable systems, we have this um, change in the status of the subject. Okay? And this was going to consume this work. So this book will be available for less than $10 in paperback form. I'll try to get it out to you for like $9 in paperback and $4 in Kindle. Okay? So trying to get for as reasonable a price as possible, okay? And the question um, is technology fulfilling subjectivity as we have this claim from uh, the social media companies that we've never been able to um, live up to our subjective potential more. Now everybody um, has a online profile in which they can promote themselves to the whole world and all of that stuff, or is this slowly destroying it? And that all depends on how you define subjectivity. And obviously the problem here is not a lack of stimulation, if by that you mean stimulation of the, the five senses. In fact, we have the exact opposite problem in that those are overwhelmed. Sight is overwhelmed by the, the um, pixelation of images on screens, okay? Our taste is overwhelmed by the technological um, uh, the technological gimmick of fast food. Fast food is a purely artificial synthesized product, which at this point has become indistinguishable for people, for, for most people from what real food would be. They simply don't even know what real food would taste like because for them, the technological gimmick of fast food is all they know. Um, at this level of smell, we're constantly bombarded with these artificial perfumes and fresheners and all of the weird smells you get walking into places um, with industrial level cleaning, uh, like like Walmart, places like that. Um, at the level of sound, we have constant electronic noise um, such that if you were to um, turn it off, for a little bit, you would suddenly feel the psychological suffering, which most people think is boredom. But what that really is, is um, the lack of sufficient amounts of noise to get you to stop thinking about how unnatural your context actually is. And of course, even at the level of touch, this is the um, most subtle um, overstimulation of our senses, but it's, it's something that needs to be acknowledged because due to a lack of work, due to a lack of going outside and doing things physically with your body, like working with tools, okay, or even walking to places, um, due to spending all of your time either in a car or in an air-conditioned office or in a suburban house or in a shopping mall, and this loss of especially natural contact, um, in that even going camping when I was a kid was done with an RV. You would literally drive an RV out to the woods and hang out in your RV and consider that to be going out into nature. Um, at the level of touch, we also have something of a technological overstimulation of the senses. And the question of whether technology is destroying subjectivity on a naive level, you'd say, well, that's ridiculous because if anything, it's actually overwhelming it. But the question is whether sense perception is subjectivity. Now, of course, for Bertrand Russell, if you take the path of um, identifying subjectivity with the physical faculties of perception, then he says when you have sufficiently defined the problem with a level of precision that it's capable of becoming science, it stops being 
philosophy. So he says, once we became specific enough about what we were talking about with subjectivity, oh, now it's literally um, sight, which the biologist can tell you how the eye functions. Um, and no, now it's, now it's taste. The biologist can tell you how the tongue functions and all of that. Then it ceases to be a part of philosophy. Okay? And he says, this is the faith that other scientists had too. When cosmology became um, astrology, which really means it became physics, it was no longer philosophy. Okay? And that's something which Russell is willing to hand over to psychologists who say, well, if you're talking about subjectivity, you're really, even at the, the, the cognitive level, talking about brain, okay? And that's also scientific. It's something which Plato actually noticed thousands of years ago is something of an equivocation because Plato said, well, there's the mind and then there's the organs of the mind and those are not the same thing. The senses are certainly important, but that's not mind. Those are tools which the mind uses. So your five senses are um, a type of uh, aid to the mind, but the mind itself is largely concerned with contents which are actually impossible to reduce to empirical uh, empirical sense contents. For example, the mind doesn't so much sense as the mind contemplates, as he says in the Theatetus. And what the mind contemplates is um, being, non-being, identity, difference, sameness, whether a number is odd, even, etc. Those are the um, the uh, the universal concerns which the mind can access through contemplation, but the senses cannot access because they are not sense contents. And of course, Husserl was also kind of interested in this distinction. For him, um, the question of whether these logical concerns, um, th such as what you would uh, normally be only seem to be able to write out logically with syntax or symbols, um, like the, the logical connectives, um, things like and, or, not, etc. Um, he says, no, they are logical, okay? And they're certainly not merely a, a, an abstraction which the brain generates um, as a lump of flesh, but you do get them in intuition. So who's real in logical investigations gives us this notion of categorical intuition in which, you know, um, certain um, things like not, or if, then, or, etc. Those are fulfilled in intuitions, and yet they're not strictly reducible to the sense data within them. That's why consciousness has this structure at a logical level, which cannot be simply outsourced to psychology, as Bertrand Russell thought. Of course, um, if subjectivity is um, this, cons this concern for... Uh, what is not reducible to sense contents, then you have to begin this trajectory, which phenomenology takes from Husserl making that conclusion to Heidegger focusing on Dasein even more primordially than consciousness and therefore necessitating understanding as a type of a fundamental type of ontological concern upon which these, even something as basic as sight is founded ontically upon this more fundamental construct of um, concern, I should say, of understanding. You only have empirical sight with your eyes because it's founded upon understanding. Of course, Gadamer takes the hermeneutical thing to a whole, uh, a whole book length concern in Truth and Method, which he says, um, hermeneutics is not merely applied to religious texts and ancient Greek classical texts. Understanding at a hermeneutical level, tells you something about being itself. You know? And of course, Kaczynski, although not maybe terribly interested in, in really going into the weeds of phenomenology, still notes that in the context of technology, interpretation is something which robots have not even the, uh, at the level of art, the possibility for. So the question of whether civilization should be preserved simply as a way to allow the classical achievements of humanity to be preserved. So we have Mozart, we have Cervantes, we have Rembrandt, and all of that is preserved simply because of civilization. So if you argue for a revolution against it, aren't you literally just setting fire to the great works of art? And he says, well, the problem with that is if you're held hostage by the civilization and really just allow it to continue to develop 
technically. What will happen is either in the future there will be robots who will have no need for art, or there will be humans who are so thoroughly modified by technology that they will similarly have no need for art, or rather they'll have no ability to experience it as art. Because there's something of a gap between the content and the act of interpretation, and the subject as such really exists in that gap. He mentions that this is also the case for morality. Um, in his short essay, Morality and Revolution, he notes that um, obviously morality is conventionally understood as like this constraining system of um, of mandates that is passed down to you from some authority figure. And that is really more like a perversion of what he calls natural morality. Natural morality differs, however, in that it doesn't give you specific commands for what to do in given situations. It instead gives you six basic principles. The um, common theme basically is this intuitive sense we have for fairness, okay? But the problem is the principles are um, things which allow you to make decisions rather than the decisions themselves. And the situations in a real world are inherently ambiguous. So there's this gap between the principle and the act, and the subject really exists in between. But there's something of an inverse relation between size of a community in which you're living and your freedom to interpret. Because obviously, even if there's two people trying to interpret a situation, there's going to be some disagreement. But um, if you expand beyond the hundred or so people that naturally may have hundred gatherer bands to the kind of artificial, globalized, impersonal society we live in today, the ability to decide for yourself has effectively disappeared. And the system has only found more ways for you to get in trouble unwittingly. Jim Rickards has noted in his book, uh, Road to Ruin, that the, the average American citizen commits three felonies a day unwittingly. And the number of SWAT raids has gone from like 3,000 a year to 45,000 a year over a certain amount of, of decades as well in the United States. So at this point, despite the fact that we have a bloated legalistic system, we've effectively lost morality. Okay, It's because the subject only exists in this gap. And if you collapse it, the subject vanishes, okay? Reducing poetic ambiguity to numerical specificity destroys art and the subject. Computers, for example, can, in a certain sense, replicate art at a numerical level. There is something of a, a binary um, numerical value, ultimately, to a Kindle book of um, Virgil or Dante or Cervantes, okay? But the experience of it as art is not that number, okay? And further, it's not even the um, outcome of some AI algorithm to, to make it look like the computer's reading it as a work of art. You can um, try to pull the wool over people's eyes with that, but that's really not the same thing because that gap doesn't exist. Okay? And what we have here is a destruction of subjectivity that is ongoing because we're destroying manifestation itself. This is kind of the Heideggerian, um, Gadamer, Gadamerian um, uh, part of it is that Heidegger mentioned with um, technological uh, problem, uh, excuse me, question concerning technology and origin of the work of art that um, the, the event as something that happens is already coming into crisis. Okay. And what you see with smartphones, especially, is something which within my hierarchy of, 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 um, of orders of meaning from my last book, it's something which paradoxically is none of them, okay? So it's an event which is not an event. You have self-moving pixels on a screen um, which drown out in many cases or risk to the ability for a gap in which the subject can exist hermeneutically. So it, it's like an event, but it's not really the kind of event in which truth happens, okay? It's a system which is not a system. Um, obviously, there is some bloated executable system in the background that's that's functioning right now, even to allow me to deliver this message. And yet it's the system which is not a system because we have abandoned the metaphysical systems of Thomas Aquinas, the transcendental system of Kant, and even the, uh, in many ways, the void system of Derrida. Now we just have the executable system, which is a system that doesn't disclose a type of Gnostic a area of exploration the way that Euclid's elements did for anyone. It simply 
um, unfolds outside of subjectivity altogether by machines and you know hundreds of thousands of you know uh, it's a, it's a thousand servers just to log into Facebook okay so there's this massive um, event which is not an event there's a massive system which is not a system and even the object is not an object because the smartphone in your hand that you get sucked into watching videos for hours um, or social media for hours it's it's a, an object which is not even able to become counter sense object to you obviously there are numerous contradictions in it um, it's the energy intensive um, device which claims to use um, uh, which which claims to be free, I should say. Okay, we have this illusion. All of this stuff is free, um, and there are numerous other contradictions. Yet yeah, it doesn't manifest itself as the object. It's the memological bias that is no longer subjective. So my phone is just about dead. Um, so let me just check for comments. Uh, and there are numerous other contradictions. Yet yeah, it doesn't manifest itself okay. as the object. Okay. So no comments. So I need to um, to go. But uh, anyway, the book will be available fairly soon and for less than ten bucks. And thanks for watching.